Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining this uh, presentation here in Seattle at the Embedded Linux Conference. Um, and today I'm here to talk about uh, the new um, major wire plumber release, which is uh, version 0.5, uh, and how now we can use this uh, new um, version to automatically handle uh, pipe wire audio filters. Uh, but before jumping to the presentation, I'm going to do a quick introduction to myself. So my name is Julian. Uh, I'm from Spain, uh, and I've been part of the multimedia team at Collabora since 2019. So I've been uh, a software developer working uh, on mostly uh, open source uh, multimedia projects such as GStreamer, Pipewire, and obviously uh, Wireplumber. Uh, I leave here my email in case you have uh, future inquiries. <clears throat> and uh, with that being said, let's jump into the uh, agenda. So uh, as you can see here on the slide, I have decided to uh, divide this presentation into uh, six different sections. So first I'm gonna do a quick introduction to Pipewire and Wireplumber uh, because even though those projects are uh, included by default in most of um, cutting edge distributions like um, Ubuntu and Fedora and Arch Linux, a lot of people are still not very familiar with them and they don't know exactly how they work. Um, so that's for the first step. Then in the second uh, section, I'm going to uh, mention some uh, uh, features about uh, the, this new uh, major wire plumber release, which was actually released uh, just uh, last month. So it's a very new release. Uh, and after that, I'm just going to focus on uh, Pipewire audio filters. I'm going to explain what they are and how they are represented by Pipewire and how this new version of Wire Plumber can uh, handle them automatically thanks to the smart filters policy. And finally, in the last section, um, I'm going to uh, show an example of how we use this smart filters policy uh, to uh, solve a problem we face at Collabora when, um, when it comes to uh, automatically switching uh, Bluetooth profiles uh, on the same device, uh, depending on whether there's an application capturing audio or not. And if I have time at the end, I'm going to do a, a small demonstration showing uh, a little bit of all of that. Uh, so that's for the introduction. Now let's um, start with the first section, which is uh, into the pipeware and wire plumber. So what's pipeware? Pipewire is uh, the next generation audio and video server to handle multimedia devices on Linux. So it's a user space daemon uh, like Pulse Audio, but it also handles uh, video as well. Uh, it's known for its exceptional performance and low latency, uh, and it's built with security in mind, which makes it uh, perfect for uh, embedded devices, but also for desktop as well. Um, <clears throat> But the most important feature, in my opinion, is that it has an external session manager. And now, the session manager uh, is not included in the project itself because it's external, uh, and it's the one that uh, controls Piper and tells Piper what to do when an event happens. Um, so that makes basically Piper adaptable for any use case. Um, when Piper was uh, created, uh, originally, there wasn't really a reference implementation of an external of a, an external session manager, so uh, there was only you know a, an example which was mostly used uh, to test Pipewire. So uh, back in 2019, we uh, had the motivation to implement a proper and reference uh, session manager for Pipewire, and that's how Wireplumber was born. Uh, Wireplumber is currently uh, the default session manager for Pipeware. Um, <clears throat> it's sponsored by Collabora, uh, and my coworker George uh, was, is the original author of it. But I've been mostly working with him since the very beginning of this project. So, as, an, as a session manager, it basically is the one charged to configure 
uh, and handle pipewire objects. So it basically configures device profiles and hardware routes. Uh, it defines access permissions between objects. It remembers all the user settings and preferences across reboots and restores them. And it's the one that is charged to decide what objects are linked with each other to form the processing graph. Because at the end of the day, Piper is it's a little bit like this streamer. It basically uh, has nodes and uh, there's links between those nodes to basically uh, form the processing graph. And uh, the most important thing about Wire Plumber is that it's uh, extensible, uh, it's modular, and it's extremely configurable because we want Wire Plumber basically to uh, work both on embedded and desktop. So uh, it actually has Lua scripts that implement the actual management functionality. Um, so if user wants to change a little bit of the behavior of Wire Plumber, they can just write a Lua script, install it, and Wire Plumber basically will um, uh, will adapt to, uh, to each use case. Um, if we have a look at the multimedia stack, we can see that um, Piper is this middle layer between the applications and the kernel. Um, and um, it basically, it's like a server where uh, applications connect to it and uh, Piper then is the one charged to uh, configure the device. Uh, the devices, like the audio devices, the video devices, uh, in this case, Lib Camera, Video for Linux, Bluetooth. Also, uh, so applications don't need to worry about checking whether the device is being used or whether they have to configure the device before they can use it. Applications, they just need to say, hey, Piper, I want to capture audio from this device or I want to capture audio from this video or I just want to play you know, audio on this device and that's it. Um, and as you can see here, Wire Plumber is another daemon that runs in user space uh, and communicates with Piper and tells him what to do when uh, all these events happen. Now, uh, the communication between uh, all of these processes is done with uh, Unix sockets. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it all runs in user space. Uh, now I'm going to quickly talk about uh, the Wire Plumber 0.5 release. So it's a new major release. Um, we've been working on it uh, two years since 0.4 was released. 0.4 was actually the first stable release of Wire Plumber that was included uh, in uh, major Linux distributions. Uh, this one uh, has a clean API to hopefully last for a long time. So it's more like a 1.0 release. So if you're going to release 1.0 in the future, I don't think the API is going to change too much, hopefully. And it has plenty of new features. Now, some of the features uh, is uh, the event dispatcher, which is actually the most important thing. Uh, I have done a talk about this uh, at the Gstreamer conference last year, if you want to know more. Uh, but it basically, uh, you know, uh, a feature that addresses many uh, race conditions in a more uh, robust and elegant way. Now, the configuration of our plumber uh, compared to 0 0.4 has been moved from uh, Lua to JSON. 0 0.5 still has Lua, but only for, the, for implementing the functionality. But the, so the configuration now is in JSON before the configuration was also in Lua. And this is to uh, keep more consistency with Piper because Piper has a JSON configuration as well. Now, 0 0.5 also introduces uh, the concept of settings. Um, now, users can change settings at runtime without you know, changing the configuration and uh, restarting Wire Plumber. Um, uh, and these settings can be useful if the user wants just to quickly change the behavior of Wire Plumber for a, you know, for a for a small period of time. Uh, and finally, which is what I'm going to focus this presentation on, is that it also introduces smart filters policy uh, to automatically handle uh, audio filters. Um, so there's a blog post, if you're more interested about the new features of 0.5, uh, done by George, uh, my coworker, uh, if you want to learn more. <clears throat> so here's the link. 
Uh, and status is the latest uh, stable version is 0 0.5.1, which was a bug fix. The license is MIT. It's hosted on a free desktop, uh, GitLab. And like I said before, it's including major Linux distributions like Fedora, or Debian, Unstable, and Arch Linux. Uh, now I'm gonna jump on the second uh, part of this presentation, uh, which is, uh, I'm gonna first explain what are Pipewire audio filters. So an audio filter, as you probably know already, is basically a, a processing unit that receives uh, input audio signal do some kind of transformation and then outputs that uh, signal uh, to some device. Um, in Pipeware, those uh, audio filters, they are actually def defined as a pair of uh, two nodes. So each filter basically has one virtual device node and one virtual client node. And this is done like this because um, that way users can basically treat those audio filters as an application and uh, a device. So users can use routing tools such as uh, Pulse Audio Volume Control, for example, to change you know, where they want to link. Um, so here, as you can see, if we have a sync filter, which is a filter that is meant to be linked with uh, a sync device, for example, speakers, the the virtual device would be um, would accept input buffers, and the virtual client would push the transform buffers to the actual device. And the same would be uh, for uh, the source filter, but in the opposite direction. So the virtual device would basically output um, transformed audio to uh, the application, and the virtual client would capture um, audio from the uh, real. A device, for example, a microphone. Uh, example of already implemented audio filters in Pipeware are uh, basically a loopback filter. Loopback is basically a filter that doesn't do anything. It, in some places they call it uh, an identity. Uh, now you might be wondering why is this useful? Uh, well, this is useful mostly to hide uh, the real device. We're going to see an example of that later. Uh, other Example of filters uh, is um, the filter chain, which is a module in Pipeware uh, that is able to load already implemented fi uh, filters from other projects such as LADSPA and LV2. And it also has some built-in filters. So usually this filter chain filter is uh, used to, uh, to implement some equalizers or compressors or limiters for audio. Now, there is also a noise reduction filter uh, for voice. Uh, this is external. I think it uses the, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I barely used it, so I'm not exactly sure how it works, but it basically uses the uh, RN noise uh, neural network to basically reduce the background noise. And finally, there's also uh, echo cancellation. This one is uh, implemented in Piper project. It comes by default uh, to basically cancel audio. Uh, by the way, all these uh, filters are uh, implemented as Pipeware modules that are dynamically loaded. So if a user wants to implement new filters, they can just you know, implement a new Pipeware module and install it in the uh, Pipeware path to load the module. And then uh, Pipeware will use it and Pipeware Plumber would work uh, the same as with the other filters. So I'm going to explain quickly here echo cancellation because it's quite an interesting filter. Um, so echo cancellation is actually a set of two filters. Uh, it has a sync filter and a source filter. Um, so the way how it works is basically uh, the sync filter monitors audio that is being uh, played on the uh, output device, for example, speakers. And then the source filter cancels the audio that is being monitored uh, in the input device, for example, a microphone, uh, to basically cancel the echo. So it basically monitors the uh, audio that is being played and it cancels those frequencies that are being monitored. Uh, now, this filter doesn't really make sense to be used um, if a user has a headset because nobody can hear audio and if nobody can hear, only yourself can hear it, uh, there's really nothing to cancel. 
and this is also this was also one of the motivations why we decided to uh, implement a smart filters policy because we only want to use specific filters only when specific uh, devices are being used. So uh, up until now, uh, <clears throat> manual user intervention with wire plumber was needed when we wanted to basically uh, use filters for specific devices. Uh, by default. Uh, when you are running wire plumber, the filters, they, all, they are always used with the default input device or output device. And if a user didn't want to use them and they want to use them only for a specific device, it was quite cumbersome because they had to uh, change the target of those filters manually uh, using tools uh, such as wire plumber control or pulse body volume control or um, even Carla. Um, and this was quite cumbersome. So um, we had the motivation of automate this task in Wire Plumber 0.5, and that's when we decided to implement the smart filters policy. Um, so now I'm going to explain how to use it uh, and how, how flexible it can be. Uh, so Wire Plumber 0.5 introduces um, several uh, properties uh, to. Uh, to um, basically control this um, automation. So the first one is a filter.smart, which is a Boolean value. By default, it's set to false. So this means that by default, uh, it's not going to uh, do any automation without filter. But if it's set to true, it basically marks the filter as smart and it's going to try to uh, link it uh, properly, uh, like the user wants. Um, then we have uh, the name property, which is a unique identifier for the filter. Then we have a before and after properties that allows uh, specifying what filters are meant to go before this one and after this one. And finally, we have the target property, which is uh, the most important one. And is basically the one uh, that needs to be set uh, uh, with the properties matching the final target node in the chain. So this property is basically meant to group filters together that want to be uh, linked with the same target. Uh, I'm going to show uh, an example of this later because it's uh, a little bit hard to understand just like this. Um, anyway, those properties can be set um, in the JSON configuration of the filter uh, so that they are permanent, like in this example. But they can also be changed at runtime easily using the filters metadata and the PW metadata command. So uh, here is an example of uh, two filters uh, that are chained together always, and they are always linked to the microphone. So we have you know, an echo cancellation source filter, and we also have a noise reduction, reduction source filter. Now, like I said, these two filters don't make sense to be used uh, with, uh, with any other device that is not a built-in microphone, for example, on a laptop. So the properties, as you can see on the left, uh, are name echo cancel. It needs to run before noise reduction, and the target is the microphone. And for the uh, noise reduction source filter, the properties are name noise reduction, the after property is set after echo cancels so that you know it's not used before. And the target is also microphone. So when they are they have the same target, they are chained together, and they are um, the order of um, of processing is defined by the uh, before and after properties. And it's always linked to the microphone, which is the top left node. Uh, and then any recording applications that want to record from the microphone, they are gonna be automatically linked to, um, to the noise reduction source filter. Um, so now I'm going to explain how we use this policy to uh, solve a problem uh, we face at Collabora uh, when it comes to automatically switching uh, Bluetooth profiles. So uh, Bluetooth is uh, very complex. There's a lot of profiles. Uh, but most of Bluetooth devices, um, they have an HTTP profile, an HSP or HFP uh, profile. 
Uh, they have those two profiles. So A2DP is basically high quality audio and it's only meant for playback, usually to listen to music or something like that. Uh, and uh, HSP is usually for video call applications. It's low latency profile and uh, it supports both capture and playback. So uh, when you connect a Bluetooth device, Piper, what it's gonna do is, uh, if it's configuring A2DP uh, profile, it's gonna just create one node. But if the user changes the profile to be HSP, it's gonna destroy uh, the uh, A2DP node and it's gonna create um, two nodes, uh, one sync node and one source node for uh, the HSP profile. And if you switch back, it's gonna destroy those nodes and it's gonna create new nodes. So this, is, um, <clears throat> this can cause a problem for applications because um, since there is no Bluetooth source node, when the A2DP profile is selected, applications can't know if the Bluetooth device support HSP profile. So we cannot know if we want to switch to HSP or not. Um, the previous version of Ripe Plumber, the, the 0.4 series, had some weird logic to work around this. Uh, it was basically auto-switching to HFP profile if the client with specific names such as Zoom or even Firefox or Chrome, uh, you know, applications that are meant to be used for video calls, uh, want to capture audio when the Bluetooth, the current Bluetooth device is uh, configured as the default device. But this, uh, this caused some problems, for example, if users were connecting multiple Bluetooth devices on, uh, on your uh, system. So ideally, what we want to do is uh, we want to use only A2DP profile when there is no application that wants to capture audio from the Bluetooth device. So how can we do that? Uh, and the solution is basically to uh, add a loopback filter for each connected Bluetooth device. Um, <clears throat> oops, yeah. So um, basically the logic works like this. Our promo creates one loopback source filter per connected Bluetooth device that support HSP profile. And that source filter basically has the same name as the HSP source node of the Bluetooth profile. And it's just there to let applications, node, uh, applications know that there is a node that can output buffers. Now, the target of this loopback filter is set to, uh, the HSP, to the real HSP source node of the device, if any, because you know, if, it's set to, uh, if the device is set to HTTP, there's no uh, HSP source node. Um, then the actual HSP source node is always hidden from applications so that applications don't know there's like two uh, source nodes for that uh, um, Bluetooth device. And then HSP and A2DP profile auto switch happens when a client node starts and stops capturing audio from the loopback source filter node. Uh, I'm gonna explain this in a demonstration at the end. Um, it's easy to understand. Uh, but I, I draw here a small diagram explaining how this works. So let's say you connect a Bluetooth device and uh, the profile is set to A2DP. Um, so there's only one node and you have the, play, uh, the playback application that is uh, sending buffers and is playing basically music on your Bluetooth headset. However, as you can see on the right, there is a loopback filter that exposes you know, a source node and uh, that source node has exactly the same name as the HSP source uh, of the Bluetooth device. Uh, and the uh, virtual client without filter is hidden. That's why it's, uh, it's gray there. So applications don't know anything about that. So regardless of which profile it is enabled, applications will always see two nodes. And if an application starts capturing audio from the filter source node on the top right, the red box on the top right, Wireplumb is gonna basically switch the Bluetooth uh, profile to HSP and it's gonna link the virtual client uh, uh, node to the actual HSP source node. Those two nodes are always hidden. That's why they are uh, gray and not red. So 
yeah, when you switch profiles, applications, they really don't know the difference because they, uh, they always think there's always two nodes available. Now, the advantage of having this is that Bluetooth profile auto switch uh, just works out of the box. So applications don't need to worry about what Bluetooth profile is set on any device. And it works with multiple connected Bluetooth devices, even if they are not configured as the default device. Now, any applications can also capture from any Bluetooth device without user intervention. And there's no need to rely on hard-coded application names like I mentioned before. Um, I think that's it. Let's see if we have time for uh, the demonstration. I'm going to do a quick demonstration now because uh, we have time. So um, as you can see here, I have a, a terminal on the left. Uh, I'm running Arch Linux, by the way, uh, which has, which runs wire plumber 0.5.1, as you can see. And on the right, I'm running Helvum, which is um, just a graphical, it's just an application to show the current pipeware objects. So for example, if I run, oh, by the way, I wanna show that. So if I show basically the processes running, you can see that I'm running Pipewire, I'm running Wire Plumber, and I'm also running Pipewire Pulse. Now Pipewire Pulse is yet another daemon that basically translates the Pulse audio requests into Pipewire requests, and this is needed so that basically any Pulse audio application can work with Pipewire. Um, so, so yeah, thanks to this I can for example, use PowerPlay to play audio, for example. I don't know if you can hear this. And you can see here that, uh, you know, the, the client is connected basically to the speakers node on the right. Oops. So uh, I can also record, power record. Uh, out dot wave. Testing one, two, three. Cancel and I can play again. Testing. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, now I have a Bluetooth headset here and I'm gonna, um, it's already paired with the laptop, so I'm just gonna connect it. And we're gonna see how the profile out of which is gonna work. Um, All right, so it should uh, connect in a few seconds. We should see some nodes coming up on the right. All right, so here it is. It's basically uh, a regular Bluetooth headset. It has a, you know, a built-in microphone and it has headphones and it supports both HTTP and HTTP profile. Um, so if I run now, for example, Power Control, which is a tool to configure um, you know, devices and client, and client, we can see that the Bluetooth profile is already set to HTTP. But we can see here that, um, so that's the micro, that's the filter that is there, even though it's in HTTP um, profile, uh, we can still see that there's some node that uh, you can, application can capture audio from. Uh, so anyway, it's HTTP profile. If I play something, we can see that um, you know the client is linked with uh, with um, with the headphones, and there's audio playing here. You can uh, hear it, but it's definitely playing something. Uh, you can actually see the activity here on the bottom that is playing on the JVC headset and the profile is still HTTP sync. So I'm gonna cancel that, but now I'm gonna uh, capture audio. I'm gonna do power record. And uh, you can see here that power record is actually getting audio from the, the virtual device. And then the virtual client is basically capturing audio from the real Bluetooth uh, device, and you can see, and this is possible because Warplumber automatically switched the profile to HSP and HFP. 
Um, see if I cancel it. We can see that the profile has switched back to HTTP because uh, we don't want to use it because we are not capturing. Uh, so yeah, anyway, these are possible things to the uh, uh, smart uh, filters policy in web number 0 0.5. And that's basically it. Uh, any, are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, is the PipeWire filter implemented as a PipeWire plugin, or is it a external process? Or uh, no, it's work? it's the same. Yeah, it's so. The question is if um, PipeWire filter is um, a plugin, right? And if it's an external process. Uh, no, so PipeWire uh, is not multi-process. Sorry, PipeWire is it's a daemon, and it runs everything in one thread. So uh, the, the filters are basically a module that are dynamically loaded, but then they are just used on the same thread as the rest of the graph. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, that was easy. So. Uh, Thank you for uh, coming and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.